So we don't usually think of venison as a day-to-day -day meal, but for the indigenous population in North America in the 18th century, it was common fare. They had it each and every day, and they had it for celebratory occasions. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So today's dish is from a reading out of the Journal of James Smith. He was writing about his experiences in 1755. As a young man, he was taken captive by the Kanawaga tribe. And after a few weeks, he was adopted into that tribe through a ceremony and a feast. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Green corn and venison is what they feasted upon that night. And these two food sources are pretty incredible as we look back upon them. Corn could be used in any number of ways. They cook them in their, in its immature state, this green corn, but they could also dry it. They could grind it up and use it preserved all through the year. So it was one of the most important food sor sources for Native Americans. Whereas venison, well, deer were plentiful in the 18th century and deer are the perfect size. Some, a man can handle it. They're fairly easy to hunt in that time period. And you could still feed a lot of people with it. Uh, so it was better than small game, but it wasn't so difficult to deal with as something like a buffalo. They didn't have to worry about preserving it as much. They could eat it before it went bad. So these two items um, are something that is very common in the diet of Na Native Americans. And in this circumstance, a common thing for feasting upon. Is that a piece of... Yep. As our corn and venison is boiling, let me read to you this segment of the account that we're working from here. He, he starts, these young women then led me up to the council house where some of the tribe were ready with new clothes for me. They gave me a new ruffled shirt, which I put on, and also a pair of leggings done off with ribbons and beads, likewise a pair of moccasins and garters dressed with beads, porcupine quills, and red hair. Also a tinsel-laced capo. They again painted my head and face with various colors and tied a bunch of red feathers to one of these locks they had left on my crown of my head, which stood up five or six inches. They seated me on a bear skin and gave me a pipe and a tomahawk and a pole cat skin pouch, which was skinned pocket fashion. When I was thus seated, the Indians came in dressed and painted in their grandest manner. And as they came in, they took their seats, and for a considerable time, there was a profound silence. Everyone was smoking, but not a word was spoken among them. At the time, at length, one of the chiefs made a speech which was delivered to me by an interpreter, and was as follows. My son, you are now flesh of our flesh, and bone of our bone. By the ceremony which was performed this day, every drop of white blood was washed out of your veins, and you are taken into the Kanawaga nation, and initiated into a warlike tribe. You are adopted into a great family, and now received with great seriousness and solemnity in the room and place of a great man. After what has passed this day, you are now one of us by an old strong law and custom. My son, you now have nothing to fear. We are now under the same obligation to love, support, and defend you that we are to love and defend one another. 
Therefore, you are to consider yourselves as one of our people. At this time, I did not believe this fine speech, especially that of the white blood being washed out of me. But since that time, I have found that there was as much sincerity in the said speech. For from that day, I never knew them to make any distinction between me and themselves in any respect whatsoever until I left them. If they had plenty of clothing, I had plenty. If they were scarce, well, we all shared the same fate. After this ceremony was over, I was introduced to my new kin and told that I was to attend a feast that evening, which I did. And as the custom was, they gave me also a bowl and a wooden spoon, which I carried with me to the place, where there was a great number of large brass kettles full of boiled venison and green corn. And everyone advanced with his bowl and spoon and had his share given to him. After this, one of the chiefs made a short speech, and then we began to eat. He goes on to describe the celebration, the party that happened after the feast, music and dancing. He goes on to describe uh, parts of this adoption ceremony, uh, both before this and after this. It's such an important part of understanding Native American culture, especially from this mid 18th century context, from somebody that it's happening to them. It's not a description from the outside. It's such an important description of something that happened 270 years ago. Green corn, venison, and a little bit of salt boiled. It couldn't be simpler. Let's find out though what the taste is like. Let me get just the right bit. So flavorful, so simple. The sweetness of a corn and this venison go together very, very well. It is, I mean, I am truly amazed by how simple it is and how rich the flavor is. It's also got some really good texture. That green corn, you know, hasn't broken down too far. So it's not like cream corn or anything like that. Um, and the meat has yet a different texture. So it's, it's great on every level. And it's just so amazingly, amazingly simple. I really love this one. This is one of those dishes where really all we have is this great description from a journal. You won't find this in any cookbook of the time period because it is so simple and it's a Native American dish. So we really only get sort of the descriptions of those. But we get to try these things out and get a feel for the context of something like we read in a journal. It really kind of fills in all the gaps for us being able to kind of grasp what was being written about in the time period. If you love videos like this, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the channel and make sure to drop in on our live streams Friday at four o'clock.